Hey folks, we're, uh, we're here today to talk about the BLH 5-55 RCX hammer. Uh, we're going to be, begin by talking about some of the features and benefits and some of the uniqueness of this new RC product. So uh, what I'd like to do is first start with the parts that make the tool unique. After that we're going to go into putting the hammer together, taking it apart, and then going through a service interval on the tool. So hey, we say we get started. So the secret to this the BLH 5-55 RCX hammer really re revolves the match of the piston and the bit. As you can see that they're roughly um, the same weight. Obviously you can't see that on the video screen, but they are. Um, one of the other very unique features about this tool is the massive bit shank that's used in this hammer. As you know, many uh, RC tools out on the market have bit retaining systems that are used to uh, retain the bit head should they shank through the spine area. Well this happens because the splines are small, they don't have enough structure to support the energy of the tool. But we've addressed this problem by offering a shank that's probably about 50% bigger than those available from competition. What makes this all possible is the use of a unique three-piece chuck system. Now the chuck is actually not a circular piece, it's uh, broken up into thirds. Each of these thirds mount around the outside of the bit to not only form the driving structure for the tool but also contain the bit retaining ring which supports the bit when it drops down. And what happens when this goes together as a group, the natural slots between these thirds form the flow channel to allow the exhausting air from the hammer to pass the outside of the bit and ultimately go around to the face of the bit. The piston is uh, pretty much of general construction. As I said, it is matched uh, almost perfectly to the, the weight of the bit. And by the way, the, this hammer size is five and a quarter OD. It gives us a bit range of five and three eighths up to five and three quarters. We can also handle up to an eight inch collaring bit, which, which is offered. One of the other features of this tool is a, a fairly uh, simple and therefore low cost sample collection tube. The sample collection tube consists of a, a simple piece of heat treated alloy tubing with a collar welded to it which is also surrounded by two shock mounts so as the vibration of the tool is occurring it doesn't transmit a lot of that shock and vibration into the tube. We'll go into how to service this piece a little bit later on in the video um, but with that said I will join you in a couple of minutes with the hammer teardown section. Hey folks, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue with our discussion about the BLH 5-55 RX hammer. Uh, this is what the unit looks like assembled. This is shown with a four and a half remit box connection. And this is a five and three quarter inch bit on the other end. So first part of the service is going to be showing you how to take the bit and chuck and sleeve assembly off the tool. And uh, from that, you'll also look at what all the parts look like that you'll be taking apart when you go through a bit change. So this is already loosened, thankfully, but uh, we'll unscrew it and take it apart. All right, so we're taking the chuck out of the hammer case right now. And, uh, it's usually a good idea to grab a hold of the bit so as it turns, it tries to thread the chuck thirds with it and hold it tight. Once you get it out, just uh, set it down on a smooth surface. So if you look at it from the outside you've got the bit, the sleeve, in this case this sleeve is uh, a sixteenth of an inch smaller, call it a millimeter and a half than the bit gauge and that's usually a good size for the sleeves to be. Uh, first thing you'll do is you'll lift the sleeve right up and over the bit. You may notice on the inside of the sleeve there are three lugs and those lugs cooperate with the slots that are located on the, created by the side walls of the chuck. So you take the sleeve off, and of course this has got to be inspected. Hold the, uh, just lightly hold the, the chuck thirds and lift the bearing out. And you may notice that when I lifted the bearing out, these holes were in line with the slots in the chuck. There's a tang located on the bottom of the bearing that will engage this location. Oh. Engage this location right here to make sure that the slots cooperate with the cuts and the chuck thirds. Um, 
About the chuck thirds, they are unique to this tool. In fact, they're unique to uh, a lot of this series of hammers. One thing is, while the chuck thirds are made to be interchangeable when they're new, as they wear, you want to try to keep them as sets. So it's a good idea to, when you're servicing these, maybe wrap them up, put them in a box or a bag, or wrap them together with something to keep, keep all these pieces together. Because what you might get is more spline wear on one piece mixed in with maybe a new part or one that's got even more spline wear. Uh, you want to look at the, check the bit out, make sure there's nothing, nothing odd with the bit. Um, in this case, these bits are a three hole bit and it's designed so that the airflow will easily go over the top of the spline and go right over the uh, nine flutes and pick the cuttings up and carry them up through the center. So assembly is exactly the opposite. The best thing to do is set the thirds on here, as I am now. Again, make sure that the tang on the bottom of the bearing cooperates with a slot. Oh, I might add, there's also a retaining wire on the side of the bearing which cooperates with a groove in the inside of the chuck. So that keeps these pieces from sliding relative to one another when you're making up the tool joint. So you slide the, slide the bearing down. Usually you'll want to assemble this with some grease or something like that, which will help hold everything together when you're working on it. So you don't have parts dropping around like, like they are right now. Put that together, take your chuck sleeve, slide it on down, and there you have it. That's your, uh, your chuck assembly. We'll get into it later, but there is a retaining wire in the lower end of the casing that the, this groove on the top of the bearing will shoulder up against to keep everything tight. Additionally, once this whole assembly is put back in the hammer, pressure exerted from the threads by the casing will actually grip the bearing and hold everything in place. So there you have it. There's, uh, there's servicing the bit and taking the chuck assembly apart. All right, so we've, we've stripped the hammer down and essentially what we have here now is the casing that has the cylinder installed and I'll explain why that's in there right now. And the next step is to reinsert the piston into the hammer and then install the retaining ring and there's a little little trick that might make it a little bit easier to uh, get this retaining ring in and I'll show you. So let's grab a hold of the piston and slide her in. Sometimes it's a good idea to hold your hand on the other side to try to keep the cylinder from popping out. And the reason the cylinder, I'll expose a little bit of the cylinder here so you can see it. The reason it's good to have the cylinder in place is it supports the tail end of the piston so that this the piston will actually slide in easier than it would if it wasn't there. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this ring and I'm going to slide it in beyond an undercut that's in the casing. Now there's, there's two undercuts in here that you're going to find. One is for the ring and the next one in is the actual return feed for the piston. We don't want to put it there. We want to try to get it into the first undercut. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the ring past the point where the undercut is and then I'm going to use the piston to square it up and slide it into the groove. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just going to slide this in by hand and I'm watching where it's going to wind up so it gets past that, that first groove. And it looks like we've got it right in there. Yeah, one little trick that I didn't mention before with respect to putting the piston retaining ring in is, I don't know if you can see this here, but the ring is put in by hand at a slight angle so that I can square the ring up with the piston by driving it down. But notice how the bottom edges of the rings are actually seated partially in the groove. And how this helps is when you drive the piston down, that will keep the ring from sliding out and make it kind of pivot in the groove and allow it to lock in the groove better. So just another pointer for you. All right, so now we're going to take the piston and just drive that ring. Going to square it up. Can you feel that? The piston locks solid. You know you got the ring in the right groove. Always a good idea to go back and verify that it is in the correct groove because 
if you push it in too far, it can get locked up in the uh, feed undercut. So there we have it. The piston's installed, the retainer ring is in, and now you can take the cylinder back out of the hammer. This may be useful to assemble when you do the upper end of the tool. All right. All right. Today we're going to take apart the back head with the intention of going through the back head assembly and also showing you how to replace the collection tube, which obviously is a critical wear item in an RC tool. So luckily we've got the back head loosened up so we can just unscrew it. Obviously in the field uh, it might take some different tools to be able to do that, but I'm sure you'll manage. Now one thing to watch is when you take the back head assembly out, there may be some loose parts on the inside because there are some lo loose parts on the end of the tool. Um, they are makeup spacer, which uh, makes sure all the parts on the upper end are maintained under tension. That's like uh, a lot of downhole hammers use a makeup ring, it's the same thing. And pretty critical part of the hammer, which is called the valve, which is normally right on here. If there's a lot of oil and so forth on the tool, it's likely that these parts will come out with it. So another thing that I've found useful when you're working on this back head assembly is to have something to grip the tube right here which keeps it from moving relative to the distributor. You can use a clamp like this or a pair of vice grips or even a hose clamp or whatever is convenient for you. Um, the first thing we want to do is actually extract the back head assembly out of the back head itself. So easiest way to do this um, is just get a, good, get a good pull and it'll just come right out. Obviously in the field, the things are, have got some dust and dirt and have gotten dried out. Might be a little bit more difficult. You might have to put it on the ground and, and uh, pull up on it a little bit harder, but that's how that assembly comes out. So this big long tube is uh, essentially the, the guts of the hammer. On this side is the adapter tube, so that's what crosses over from the collection tube to the type of connection you're using, whether it be Remet or Metski. Uh, on the other side, we have the end of the tube, which engages the bore of the bit. And in between, we have everything else. So probably the best way to explain this all to you is to just start taking it apart, and uh, we'll go through it piece by piece. So it all begins with taking the adapter tube off. You just grab a hold of the collection tube and just give it a little bit of a turn and a pull, and it'll come off. Of course, in the field, again, if these O-rings have gotten dried up, and it may turn out that it's a little bit harder to do that, but you'll figure out a way. Um, the adapter tube consists of uh, two O-rings on the OD, which match up with the uh, center pipe of your tube, which goes over and seals. There's also two O-rings on the ID, which seal against the collection tube, and they actually cooperate with a couple of little grooves in the end of the tube, which helps keep all this stuff secure when you're working on it. So. That's part number one. Part number two, which will come off, will be the, the check valve itself. Um, check valve's got an O-ring on the OD, which seals up against the bore inside the back head. It also has a lip seal on the ID, so it's a good idea to check those for cracks or uh, loss of deflection and so forth and service them as needed. Next thing is the check valve spring, pretty heavy duty uh, guy that uh, pushes the check valve up against its seal point. Next piece that comes off is the debris screen. Uh, one thing that we know about the debris screen is that it has to be put on top of the this piece which we call the tube cap the correct way. The tube cap has an undercut area on one side and a flat area on the other. The screen always goes on the end with the undercut. So there's the undercut, there's the screen, goes right on there and those two pieces would just go back like this. What this tube cap does is it actually captures the tube within the distributor. So you'll see when I take the tube out how this, how this actually operates. So you just grab a hold of the tube and pull it right out of the air distributor and um, you're ready to service or replace or inspect the tube. And what I was talking about before is that the, the tube has two bumper O-rings on either side of it. One of the O-rings butts a, a groove in the distributor, and the other clamps up against one of these ends here. So when this is all tightened up, it's squeezing the tube in the air distributor between the distributor and the tube cap. 
The, uh, the collection tubes uh, are supplied with a spare set of bumper rings as part of the kit, so that's what you'd replace. And what it consists of are the a heat treated alloy tube with a bumper ring that's actually welded to the midsection of it. So inspection, uh, you'll see specs in our booklets. Want to make sure the end of the tube has still got some meat in there. If that's getting too thin, it'll be replaced. Anybody who's worked on RC tools will know exactly what I'm talking about. So that's the tube. Uh, all these pieces um, then go together, but let's spend a little bit of time talking about the valve of this. <clears throat> This beast. All the BLH5 hammers have a, a valve cycle. What this valve does by opening and closing, it controls the airflow into the drive chamber of the hammer. And we can tune these valves as well. If you look closely, there's some small metering ports. Uh, there'll either be two or four of them. And it comes from the factory with uh, a few of these plugged. If you want the hammer to use less air, air consumption, you could knock out one or more of those plugs. So that's kind of a unique way of controlling the timing of this valve. Uh, inspection of the valve really involves just looking for burrs and nicks or wear. This is a nitrided steel part, so wear on the ID surfaces should be almost non-existent. Uh, there's also a couple of seals, actually almost look like piston rings that are on the uh, the distributor that the valve seals against and those can be taken off and they should be checked as well. Really what you want to do to make sure this whole system is working properly is when you put the valve on just make sure that you feel a little bit of drag of those seals. Sometimes to get the valve to go on properly you have to get those little piston rings centered up but if you feel just a little bit of drag from those then you know that everything is more than likely okay. Now, of course, lastly is the makeup ring, and what this does is this applies pressure between the bottom of the surface of the back head and the top of the distributor and makes up all the parts tight. So I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's go ahead and put everything back together, and uh, we'll start with this. We'll take the, take the tube, slide it in. thing we'll do is we'll put on the makeup ring. Slide that on. That always has to go on before the valve. The, uh, let's put the valve on here. Make sure it seals up. And this is where this little clamp piece I was telling you about comes in handy. It'll help keep that tube from moving around when you're working on this end of it. So next thing on is the tube cap. Remember the direction I told you about? Flat side down. And then we'll put on our screen. If you look carefully, the screen actually pilots on a small diameter on the top of the tube cap, so that keeps it from moving around and centers it. And when you put the spring on, it actually clamps that, uh, that screen in place. Next up is our check valve. And, and lastly is the uh, adapter cap, that tube adapter. So you can hear it snap on. We'll take the clamp off, grab it by the collection tube. This will hold everything together. And we just drop it right into the back head again, just like we did when we took it apart. Let it seat. And just thread it back in. That's it. Yeah, so we're just about finished with the strip down now. We've got the bit and chuck assembly taken out. We went over the, the back head and collection tube assembly. The only thing left in this casing right now is the cylinder, the piston, and the piston retaining ring. So let's go through the process of getting the piston out of this thing and, uh, and we'll be done. So one thing I wanted to point out in the part that we really haven't spent much time talking about is this internal cylinder. Uh, this internal cylinder is what the tail end of the piston reciprocates in. It also provides the seat for the valve that I talked about. Um, but the reason it's important at this stage of the game is that I want to use this cylinder to support the tail end of the piston as I start to drive the piston out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just cycle the piston back and forth by hand 
every time nudging that little wire ring until I get the wire ring all the way out. Now, this process works pretty good by hand, but if things are kind of gummy and dirty and the oil's been washed out, sometimes the best way to do this is to pick the casing up and drop it with the piston on a piece of wood and the weight of the piston will actually drive the ring out. So I'm going to start by trying to do this by hand. You're going to see me doing this with the cylinder every now and then because when I take a swipe with the piston, I knock the cylinder back and I have to get the cylinder back into place. So, so here we go, I'm pushing the cylinder back in. I can feel the ring, the ring move, moved a little bit at the time. Get that cylinder back in. And there you go. So there's the ring, the pistons popped it out. Um, <clears throat> The ring's actually pretty durable, you know, when you get, get, get the thing out, you probably want to check it out and make sure that there's no, the ends aren't broken off or nothing's cracked, but um, yeah, it's usually they're pretty durable. And then a little bit later on, we're going to go into the inspection of the piston and the cylinder. Of course, there's the cylinder sliding over the piston. Um, <clears throat> show you where these parts need to be measured to make sure they're all within spec. Let you know what parts should be replaced if the hammer starts to lose power. And uh, so we'll join you, join in a couple when we get back to doing the measurements. All right, one of the most important things about servicing a downhole drill is checking the operating clearances of a hammer. Now, when you have high pressure air uh, leaking past a leak path with you know, anywhere from a couple of thousands to uh, or more, uh, you can actually develop quite a bit of what we call leakage flow. So Hammers run the best when leakage flows are the minimum and the clearances are the smallest. So some people that want to get into detail servicing the hammer are interested in, in measuring these clearances and replacing parts as they, they get worn. A rule of thumb that I've used is when the clearances wear to the point where you lose 20% of your out-of-the-box performance, it's probably time to service things. So let's first look at where all these leakage areas are inside the hammer. Um, Probably the biggest one, and the one that contributes most to performance loss in a hammer, is the clearance between the large diameter of the piston here and the bore of the casing here. That probably accounts for maybe 40% on a, uh, a thousandths, per thousandths of wear versus all the other clearances. The next important one is again, the larger the, the diameter, the more the clearance is going to make a difference, is the clearance between the tail end of the piston and the bore of the cylinder. That's this clearance right here. Uh, the other clearance that's important is between the end of the guide, which is this diameter here, and this end of the piston. And uh, finally, the clearance that's also pretty important is the, the lower end bearing, which is the ID of the bearing as it fits in with the nose of the piston right here. So I'm not going to show you how to measure all of these things. It's pretty obvious, but some of the techniques are, um, are pretty common in the practice. So it, it, at its simplest case, what you need is a set of micrometers. I mean, you can buy a set like this uh, pretty cheap. These are, these are made offshore. Um, and probably a few hundred bucks will get you a big set of mics like that all the way up to 12 inches, I believe. So, you know, you get your clearance on your, on your diameter. And you'd write it down. Our, our parts books and technical service manuals show what these clearances are. In fact, they give you recommended discard uh, clearances and diameters for and bores for all these parts. So you'd measure there. At the same token, you might take a, a telescopic bore gauge and slip it in here and measure the bore. You obviously want to try to get the measurement in the area where the piston's doing most of the work. Uh, and you can usually tell where that is just by looking for wear tracks inside. Another simple way is just to measure this, then come back and measure this, and just note the difference, you know, and compare that to uh, the wear out point. If you want to get even more technical though, and it starts getting into some higher dollars for getting proper gauging, this is called a, this is a sun and dial bore gauge, and these are the folks that make uh, bore measure equipment for, for motors. These are very accurate and uh, you can set these up to measure inside the cylinder, 
It's especially useful inside the casing where you need to reach down inside a long bore. But to use one of these, you just drop it in. Of course, you would you have a set gauge where you set this for what your dimension should be. And then what you're looking for is how much distance you have beyond that. And the way you do this is you rock this back and forth until you measure the minimum point, and you can pick that. You'll see there's a gauge on the end, and that dial is going to go back and forth as, uh, as you take your measurement. And that's, uh, that's about, about all there is to it. Um, this will make you, allow you to make an educated guess in terms of which parts should be replaced. Um, and like I said, the one that paid most attention to is this large diameter on the piston and how it works with the casing. Generally, it's this diameter on the piston is the one that wears down the fastest and the one that uh, contributes most to wear.